The Dispatches program was aired on 15th February 2011 on UK terrestrial television. It was titled Lessons in Hate and Violence. Channel 4 have broadcasted a program targeting primarily the Obundi institutions in the UK. In some institutions they have installed covert recording devices over two years. Over that time they have managed to gather and compile a handful of inappropriate comments allegedly made by teachers. Many of these occasions were dealt with by the institutions themselves and have been resolved over six months ago. I will talk about this in a bit more detail. It is not uncommon in any school for staff to have to be occasionally subject to disciplinary measures due to inappropriate behaviours. What is of the main concern here that it is only Islamic schools, particularly the Deobandi institutions that are being targeted here. With regards to the violence portrayed in the video, one can clearly say that this is not Islam, but it is cultural values which should be kept away and not be confused with Islamic beliefs. The Prophet is a guide for us and his treatment of children is seen through narrations known as Hadith. For example, it is narrated in Bukhari that Allah's Messenger kissed Al-Hasan ibn Ali while Al-Aqra ibn Habiz al-Tamim was sitting with him. Al-Aqra said, I have ten children and have never kissed one of them. The Prophet cast a look at him and said, Whoever is not merciful to others will not be treated mercifully. In another narration in Bukhari, the Prophet said, It happens that I start the prayer intending to prolong it, but on hearing the cries of a child, I shorten the prayer because I know that the cries of the child will incite its mother's passions. These two hadiths give a glimpse of how Muslims are taught to treat children and as the documentary starts it gives an impression that violence and hate preaching is going on many institutions where in fact this is totally contrary to the facts. In fact children who do go to these institutions learn about etiquettes and manners they should adopt against people who are not of the same faith as them. And violence against children is not something which is just happening in the madrasas and the, uh, and the Islamic institutions. Just last year, Mike Barrel 51 was found guilty in December of grabbing a 15 year old boy by his jumper and threatening and pinning another boy against the wall. Just imagine if this is secretly filmed zoomed in and played over and over again. Of course this will not be acceptable. In another occasion, teachers brutally attack on boy 13 at US school posted on YouTube. This was showing a teacher who just lost it with a child and is punching, kicking, dragging this child and the video is on YouTube. What happened to the teacher? He was fired. And according to the Telegraph, and the Yorkshire Post, in the last two years, 150 school staff in England have been sacked or reprimanded for offences including sexual assault, showing students pornographic material and sex with a pupil. Now imagine if, you know, cameras were taken into these schools and secret filming was taking place and it was zoomed in and again repeated and also the sexual abuse that takes place in the Catholic Church. This was not secretly filmed and made into a documentary and posted as if all Christians are like this. Of course, we know all Catholic Christians do not believe this and many have condemned this. Dr. Taj Hagi, a supposed moderate Muslim, was interviewed on numerous occasions by dispatches, but it needs to be known that he has not graduated from any notable and recognized institution and does not share the beliefs of the mainstream Islamic community. For example, the niqab, the covering of the face, is a choice which women have and the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would wear it. Yet, despite knowing these facts, he says, and I quote, it is not part of Islam and refers to it in a derogatory sense as a face mask and claims that it is alien to Islam and further calls towards the burqa ban 
on an interview on Sky News. I mean, this is not the part of Islam. I mean, this notion that somehow they have a human right to have it. I don't have the human right to go to, to, to cover my face down the road. So why do we have a situation in this country where we're supposed to have a gender equal society, where we have uh, women be able to have, be, have a face mask and men not? I mean, either we have face masking for all or we ban it for everyone. Moving on to the point of the word kafir. The word kafir lexically means disbeliever and it is a term which Allah calls the non-Muslims in the Quran and in no school of thought is it regarded as derogatory. And to be compared with the n-word to black people is grossly misleading the masses. Surely Allah would not use such terminology in the Quran if it was like calling a black person the n-word. The counter argument that we could face is but it was used in a bad context. Well, that can happen with any word. Just like amongst the youngsters, the word bad can mean good. But it doesn't mean that it can't be used at all because certain people regard it to have another meaning. It's simply illogical. The classic texts of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet refer to non-Muslims as kafir, not in a derogatory sense, in the sense that they are non-Muslims. Moving on, dispatches said that these scholars encourage not being like the non-Muslims. Well, UK is known for being multicultural and diverse because of the fact that everybody is different and they bring a new flavor to the country. Just like the dress in the Middle East and in particular in Saudi Arabia is the thobe, which is a long cloak type covering. And when foreign dignitaries and visitors go there, they are not expected to dress like that. And usually, they remain in their suits and ties. And they are not reprimanded because of that. And we have further examples of where people prefer to keep their own heritage alive and not copy their surroundings. And that should be their choice. Why should anyone force them to adopt their views? For example, the Amish in the USA, the monks in China, the Amazon tribes of Brazil are just a handful of examples to prove my point. Regarding not to listen to music and dancing, this quite simply is the belief of the Muslims and it shows the desperation of the program that they are referring to these issues like they are some sort of major problem. Even many non-Muslims don't like to sing and dance. Along with Dr. Taj Hagi, Dr. Ghayasuddin Siddiqui is also part of British Muslims for Secular Democracy. He is quoted to say the Ubandis are dangerous and extreme in their views. In Islam, women leading the prayer is not permissible, in which there is a consensus of the scholars. Yet, he invited Dr. Amina Wadud, a female, to lead Muslims in prayer. He also endorses HFA, which claim to be a halal monitoring organization, yet they explicitly don't follow the fundamentals of halal slaughter. The examples that I have mentioned is just to prove that he is also not of the mainstream Muslims, of which dispatches show Dr. Taj Hagi and Ghayasuddin Siddiqui to be model moderate Muslims, which they are far from. Just as a side note, the current law in the Children's Act 2004, Section 58, also being a point of focus on a 2005 BBC report, state that light hitting is fine so long as no mark is left. This is referring to when an adult hits a child. This law leaves many questions as to what if the child has dark skin, how will light beating be measured? Before being highly critical of what took place in the Darululum, one needs to focus on changing the law which governs the entire country, not just a handful of madrasas. Uh, moving on, with regards to other kids beating up smaller children, <laughs> I'm sure dispatches will fail to come up with what a single school in which this doesn't happen in the playground. In fact, in many schools now, there are police present because of gang violence that seeps in. Children take knives and guns and there have been many cases of physical violence even against teachers as well. Darloon Birmingham, after these cases had been brought to their attention, have taken action which have included expulsions of students and dismissals of staff as long as six months ago. 
the fact that the producers were fully aware that the matters had been dealt with thoroughly demonstrated their ill intent. I have added the link if you would like to see what the institution did in more detail, but to summarize, here are some of their responses. The derogatory comments regarding Hindus were made by a senior student, whom we expelled very soon after the 3rd of August 2010, for holding and expressing such views that are completely contrary to our ethos. There were no teachers present at the time the incident occurred. With regards to why the scholar who was brought in to give a speech, they said they wanted to show courtesy to an external speaker and not challenging assertions in public. Any statements made that are contrary to our ethos are subsequently readdressed in the classroom. Discussion and education of such assertions with the students are for the classroom. Moving on to how dispatchers handle the situation. Due to the tone and gravity of the allegations, it is very concerning that the program has placed the students' safety at risk. Even before the broadcast of the program, the institution started receiving a barrage of hate calls and mails threatening them. As a result, they decided to bring forward their half-term week because the students were in danger. Further, the police deployed extra officers in the area as a precaution because of the program. The program makers did not blob out the faces of the students in the trailer and many of the students' faces were clearly visible. Channel 4 has since removed the 40 second clip. The released footage also led to the sun using a still image from the footage of one of the students which is careless and downright dangerous. The edition was Saturday, February the 12th, 2011 on page 13. The people of Darlum Deoband were seen to be people who live in the past, hold extreme views and are away from the mainstream Islamic faith. This is absolutely incorrect because they are Hanafi in jurisprudence and part of the Sunni majority. It clearly shows the lack of research by the program. In fact, in February 2008, an anti-terrorism conference organized by the seminary Darlalum in Deoband, Uttar Pradesh, denounced all forms of terrorism, declaring that Islam forbids the killing of innocent people and Islam sternly condemns all kinds of oppression, violence and terrorism. Dar al has such luminaries the likes of Mulana Hussein Ahmad Madani, who was born in 1879 and passed away at 1958. One of the leading pioneers of the Oband, who campaigned with Mahatma Gandhi for Indian independence. On living with other faiths, he once wrote, If Muslims cannot form a nation with non-Muslims, if Islam does not permit it, then how was it that the Prophet formed a composite nation with the Jews? Further, after looking at all the rulings on the Darul Ifta site of Dar al Ulum Deoband, I found 10 fatwas, rulings, relating to the subject on churches, and all followed the theme of saying it is makruwe tahrimi, which means highly disliked. Therefore, it should be avoided. Just like the public can't go to military bases and inside the Parliament House and inside 10 Downing Street, there are secular reasons. So, for Muslims to go in churches, it is not forbidden, but it is preferred not to go. It is a religious ruling. So, in conclusion, roadblocks to integration of Muslims into the West is being done primarily by the media alienating them and dehumanizing them. By doing this, the media becomes guilty of widening the gap and setting breeding grounds for those who may not be tolerant. I urge the viewers to do their own research after watching such programs and not make rash assumptions based on what they see on TV. A few years ago, WMDs were spoken as though they were fact, yet they turned out to be a covert reason just to get oil. Many thanks for watching. Jazakallahu khairan. Subhanallah wa bihamdi subhanakallahu.